In the last module, we explored the steps to hypothesis testing, forming our statistical hypotheses, that is, the null and alternative, predicting and establishing a standard of evidence, which involved creating our alpha value, testing our hypotheses, which involved data collection and forming a test statistic, and finally, evaluating our hypotheses in light of the evidence we've collected. Specifically, in this course, we'll be comparing our p-value, our observed proportion more extreme in the sampling distribution, against our standard of evidence, our alpha value. And the decision will always be, if our p-value is less than alpha, then we reject the null hypothesis. Remember, when p-values get smaller, that means the result was less likely to happen when chance alone was responsible for the difference. These steps may seem overly formal right now, but they're designed to keep us from making particular types of errors. Now we need to turn our attention to those errors that we make in statistical decisions. Now, errors in this case don't mean errors in the sense that we did something wrong, but rather, we always have sampling error acting on our sample statistics. So although we have the best intentions to make the right decision, there will sometimes be a mismatch between what is true in the world and what we decide on the basis of sample data. Specifically, in the world there is only two possible truths, and one of these has to be true and only one of these can be true. That is, they're mutually exclusive. Either there is no effect, HO is actually true, or there is some effect, H1 is true. If we go back to our diagram, we can see that it really is the case that that mean after treatment is either equal to 100 or not equal to 100. This isn't a matter of sampling error. If we were to treat an entire population, the mean after treatment, all things else being equal, would be either 100 or not 100. So there are two truths in the world, and we are on one side of this truth line. That is, we're either in a world where there is no effect and we're measuring only sampling error, or we're in a world where there is some effect and our sample is measuring not only sampling error, but also that true effect. On the basis of our sample, we'll make a decision about which truth we believe is actually true for the world, but notice that we won't always be able to make the right decision. Sampling error is always acting, so occasionally we'll get samples that are different from whatever truth there is out there in the world, and this will lead us to make a decision that's wrong. Let's look at the decisions we can make. Let's start assuming that there is no effect in the world, that is, HO is actually true. Now, our decisions can be fail to reject the null hypothesis, which will happen if we get a sample that lands us in that central region of the sampling distribution, and in that case, this would be a correct decision. It's correct because there is a correspondence between our decision and what is true in the world. We fail to reject the null, and this is a world where the null is true. On the other hand, if we're in a world where there really is some effect of whatever we're doing, that is H1 is literally true, and we reject the null hypothesis, well that's also a correct decision. That's what we hope we would do if we're in a world where H1 is actually true. Again, these are correct decisions because there is a correspondence between what we say is true about the world and what is actually true about the world. Now we hope when we do statistics that we will be in one of these two categories, failing to reject the null when the null is actually true, or rejecting the null when the null is false, said differently when the alternative is true. But we won't always make these correct decisions. There are two types of errors we have to deal with. Let's again go back to the state of the world where there is no effect. If we reject the null hypothesis, and remember rejecting the null hypothesis is saying that we don't think the null hypothesis is a reasonable explanation because of the sample data we got, if we do that, this is an incorrect decision. We're claiming to the world the null is not true, or at least is not a good explanation for the outcome we observed, but this is a world where the null is true. So we happen to get a sample that led us astray. On the other hand, if there is an effect in the world, H1 is true, and we fail to reject the null hypothesis, that is, we say the null hypothesis is still a reasonable explanation for the observed effect, well, that's an incorrect decision. These are mismatches between what is true in the world and what we are claiming about the world. Now, these errors are pretty important, so we give them names. Starting with rejecting the null hypothesis, when we're in a world where the null is true, that's known as a type 1 error. And a type 1 error is when no effect is present, that is, we're only measuring sampling error, but a researcher rejects the null hypothesis as reasonable. Now, we call this a false alarm or an alpha error. 
And it's called a false alarm because imagine we're in a world where there's no effect and we're claiming that there really is. Our test has false alarmed. It's a false alarm because we're in a world where there's nothing to alarm about. So this type 1 error is rather important. This is what we will be protecting science from by doing this entire hypothesis testing enterprise. We'll come back to that point in just a minute. On the other hand, when we fail to reject the null hypothesis, when we're in a world where the null hypothesis is really false, this is known as a type 2 error. So a type 2 error is when a real effect is present, but a researcher fails to reject the null hypothesis. So this is known as a miss or a beta error. Now, if this terminology is new for you, don't let that make you think this is anything complicated. All we're doing here is showing the matches and mismatches between a decision and the truth in the world. This comes from simply binary classification. If you like, use a different example. How about a smoke detector? A smoke detector is doing something fairly similar to our statistical test. It doesn't measure all the air in your house, just some of it. And because of this, it will sometimes be correct and it'll sometimes be wrong. So let's look at the smoke detector in this context. The truth in the world is there either is no fire or there is a fire. So if you are in the world where there is no fire and your smoke alarm isn't beeping at you, well, that's perfectly fine. That's a correct decision. However, if you're in that world where there is no fire and your smoke alarm starts beeping at you, that's a false alarm. It's an inaccurate prediction or an inaccurate statement about the truth in the world. Now, if we're in the world where there is a fire, so your house is actually burning down and your smoke alarm isn't beeping, well, that's a miss. That's a pretty bad thing to happen for you because your house is going to burn down. Now, if you're in that state of the world where there is a fire and your smoke alarm is beeping, well, that's perfectly good. That's what we hope it would do. It's a correct rejection of the null hypothesis. So, all we're really talking about here is the correspondence between our decision based on noisy data. Notice we don't measure the whole population, so these errors will happen some proportion of the time. 